All right, we'll do one last problem on this uh, chapter one stuff. So I like this one. This is kind of a, again, getting you a little more to an actual type of design. Uh, here's a structure that's uh, loaded up in a certain way, and you have to check or size a couple of different elements here. All right. So here we have uh, two bars, uh, BA and BC. All right. They're pinned together. They're pinned at joint A. B and C. Those are all pin joints. And you can see here is sort of the top view if you looked down at A. So this bolt going through A acts in single shear along that plane. All right? At B, the way B is, uh, it kind of comes around this element here. Uh, a B comes around and grabs. See, this is A. That's element A B, and this is supposed to be element B C. And here you can see this pin is in double shear, so it has two shear planes acting on it. Okay. The problem here wants you to size B C. Okay, basically the thickness of BC out of the out of the paper because it sets the height at 1.5 inches, and also the two pins. All right, so I actually might break this video up into two parts uh, so I can get it out to YouTube. Um, and what it tells you is, as is typical, that the pins are made of a different material than the elements, so it gives you a allowable normal yield stress in element BC and then also an allowable shear stress, average shear stress in the pins. All right. Now here there is no factor safety so here they're calling it allowable so that's basically what we got before that would be maybe the if they're designing to yield that's the yield over the factor safety or if it's brittle and they're designing to actual failure or some other fatigue type of loading uh, if I drop it down from, from failure, it's that value divided by the factor of safety. But they've already done that for you, so what we're going to consider is those values are going to be the ones that we're going to design too, all right? All right, so we actually have three elements that we have to size here, the pin at A, the pin at B, and then also member BC, okay? And uh, I guess it's allowing you to say that... Uh, I think what it's inferring here is that the pins at A and B are the same diameter. I mean, you don't want to have different size pins make your life easier. So what we have to do is figure out the max stress in both of these. One of them will be higher. That will be our limiting design case, and that's what we'll use to design the diameter of the pin. Okay? All right. Let's first do uh, member BC. Okay? That's the normal stress part. Okay? So this is uh, oh, this is the problem F. This is uh, a review problem one one o three, and it's on page sixty two in Hibbler. And I've written on top of the piece of paper that I don't like to write on, but okay, fine. And I have to zoom out again. Uh, one of these days I'll get used to this and actually zoom out. All right, there we go. There's my page. Oops, too much. Let's zoom out. There we go. All right, so this is the problem we're going to do. All right? Okay, so first, let's, let's consider element BC. All right? Uh, so It really doesn't matter what free body diagram I look at. Well, I actually it probably does because I guess one of them has more information than the other. But I need to know something about the reaction loads, whether I consider this one or this one. This is the one that's sort of at the top. This would be point C. This is point A. At point A, you know, both A and C we allow for P 
pin types of reaction forces. Okay. All right. Now the other thing we use here to make our life simpler. Okay. This is B. And this is a distributive force. All right. So in this situation, I really can't draw a section that'll let me get at the force in this element without really dealing with uh, the reaction forces, okay? So we need to get the reaction forces. Well, if you look at this, you'll say, oh, well, I have four reaction forces, so this is statically indetermined. But you have to remember, we didn't, we didn't explicitly go over this in review, but since we're pinned both at B and C, this is a uh, two-force member, so that means you actually know uh, the direction that this reaction force acts in. So the reaction force actually is not like this. You actually know the reaction force acts along the line BC. Okay? So it's a two-pin, it's pinned to both sides, and there's no other loads in the element. So the reaction forces have to be along the line BC. Okay? Uh, at A, that's not the case, although it's pinned to both A and B, we have this intermediary distributed load, which might, uh, has to be compensated. And you can obviously see that from the free body diagram anyway. If we just act along AB, that'll give you this force, but you need a Y force to counteract this downward um, distributed load. Okay? All right. So in fact, what that does is once you recognize that it's a two-point member or two-force member, that you know the angle. So uh, you have the magnitude. That's the unknown, and then the x and y components at a. So I'm going to call this. Um, uh, let's call this reaction x, reaction y at point a, and this is just going to be the reaction at c. All right, so we know the direction. All right. All right. Uh, well, let's figure those out. The way to do that is actually we have to consider uh, first the free body diagram on the whole uh, entity. So let me do that. Piece of paper. Okay. So we need to figure out the reaction forces for the whole body. Let's see if they gave us enough information on that. Let's draw the free body diagram for the whole structure. Okay, so we have R X at A, R Y at A, and we have R C. And I know this angle here is sixty. I should have drawn it up a little more to get my, you know, my sines and cosines correct. Remember we talked about that last time that actually it's. It's usually kind of beneficial to kind of sketch. Well, let me do it. I should, just do it. I should do what I say. So it helps kind of get the, the other elements correct, okay? It helps us get our angles. When we do the cosine and sine, it keeps a little good sanity check. All right, so R, X at A, R, Y at A, and then here is R, C. C, I put the C up there. All right. Um, this is 60. Okay, so if we do sum of forces in the x direction, and I guess the other thing we can do here is we can replace the distributed load with its equivalent point load. So that is going to be acting through the center, right? Four feet, and this is four feet, right? And the magnitude of this is the two kip per foot times eight feet, or in other words, 16 kips acting downward, okay? All right, so if we do sum of forces in the x, that gives me RC. Its x component is cosine of 60, 
and then plus r x and a, and that has to equal zero. Cosine of 60 is one half, and then um, right. So this just gives you the relationship that r c has to equal minus two times r a x component. All right, let's do sum of forces in the y direction. Those has to have to equal zero. So that gives me um, RC sine of 60, or that's rad 3 on 2. Uh, the P is acting downward, so that's minus 16 kips. And then RYA acts up, and that has to equal 0. <coughs> All right, finally, we have to do sum of moments. And unfortunately, how am I going to do this? Uh, I don't know where this point is. All right, so if I were to try to do sum of moments, well, I guess you could still figure it out. If you did sum of moments around A, you could figure out this moment arm. Okay. Uh, or we could do sum of moments around B, and the nice thing about that is it takes out the moments from RC because it acts along that line. And these are a lot easier to deal with. So let's do that. Let's do sum of moments around point B. Those have to go to zero. All right, so P puts a negative moment. It's negative 60 kips, and its moment arm is Four, let's put everything in inches, four times 12 inches. That's the moment of P around B. Uh, the X force does no moment, has no moment arm around B, but the Y reaction force at A gives me a positive moment. So that's positive R, Y, A. And its moment arm is eight feet, or the eight times 12 inches. And that has to equal zero. All right, so that'll immediately give me R, Y, and A. So the 12s will cancel out. So I get R, Y, and A has to equal uh, 16 kips times 4 divided by 8. The 12s cancel out. And that gives me um, 8,000 pounds. Okay. Now that I know that, I can use that to solve for RC in this equation. So that'll give me, using this equation, putting this into here, and then that'll give me RC times rad 3 on 2 minus 16 kip plus 8 kip has to equal zero, or in other words, RC is equal to um, two on rad three. This is a minus eight kips, bring to the right hand side, that becomes a positive eight kips, right? And that equals 16 divided by rad three. Oh, wait a second. Six. 16 enter 3 radical. All right. So that's 9.24 kips. And then the last one we can do is get the reactions at um, an x direction A from this equation. So now I can take these values, put it into um, the sum of forces in the x direction. That'll give me the following equation. Uh, R A at X equals minus one half 
RC, but I know that that is 9.24 kips. So that gives me minus uh, 4.5, 4.5, 4.67 kips. Just do that in my head. Okay, so actually it's flipped the other way. All right, so actually Rx is acting this way, so this element here will be uh, in tension. All right, all right, so now that we got all the reaction forces, all right, we can go solve uh, what's going on in element BC. And actually, I think I'll probably start stop here and, and do that in another video, okay?